Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Amen. Are we on? Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you, Glenis, uh, so much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, good morning. My name is Chris, uh, part of the, uh, the, the staff team here at Love Church, um, one of the pastors. It's great to be um, back with you. You've been off for a couple of weeks. Um, today we are, as Tim has said, we've, we're carrying on with part two of our three-part mini-series called Living the Psalms. Um, the Psalms are these uh, books right in the middle. If you open up your Bible, right in the middle, you'll find the Psalms. And they are these ancient songs, these uh, poems, which express a whole bunch of emotions, a whole bunch of feelings and thoughts and, and praise directed to God. Um, the Psalms are often referred to as the, the prayer book of the Bible. They would have been some of the prayers which Jesus would have uh, prayed through. Uh, if you were here last week or, or in, in the evening, um, Ella opened up this series with a fantastic look at uh, the Psalms of Orientation. She said that the Psalms can be roughly divided into sort of three categories, uh, categories which represent um, three different seasons of life. Um, the Psalms of Orientation, which Ella spoke about, um, that's when life is rosy, you know, when everything's going splendidly, when we feel God close to us we feel blessed if you would but then there's the psalms of disorientation and that's when things are a bit more ugly that's when life takes a turn for the worse when some you or somebody you know gets a sudden and scary diagnosis when a child has been taken from us when a business collapses a friend dies when someone we love leaves us when Everything is not okay. When God seems far off or even mean. So they're the Psalms of disorientation. And then there's the Psalms of new orientation. When unexpectedly things turn around again. Somebody gets well, uh, a new job lands. Somebody finds love. When we see sort of blessings and fruit and, and, and happiness and goodness returning to our life. And God seems present again. But this morning, this morning we're dealing with that dark place. When the Psalms of orientation no longer ring true. Today we deal with disorientation. When life is hard. When pain enters our lives unexpectedly. See, if, this, if the Psalms are the prayer book of the Bible, then they model something for us. They model how we can and how we are allowed to respond to pain. So today, this morning, we're not talking about why. We're not unpacking why there is suffering in the world. Why does God allow things to happen to, bad, to good people? Why does bad things happen to us? But today is about how we respond well when they do. Because the reality is life can hit us pretty hard. Sometimes. Am I right? See, around uh, one third of these psalms are these lament psalms, these psalms of disorientation. They are complaints, they are shouts of emotional pain and anguish. And if it's okay for those to be in the Bible, then it's okay for that to be in our lives. In fact, it's encouraged for these psalms to be in our lives. Now, the church has got a dirty secret. We, we forget about these psalms. 
we kind of shoved them out a little bit. You see, it's not very seeker-friendly for us to start a service with a psalm of vengeance for our enemies, is it? Right? Calling down curses on our, family, on, our, on our enemies' families. Inviting infertility on an enemy's spouse. Imagine that. Imagine if we opened our church service with that. Welcome to church, everybody. Uh, help yourself to donuts and, and coffee and have a whole heap of vengeance on your enemies. It's not what we do. It's not very Christian of us. But these psalms are Christian. These psalms should be part of our life, part of our worship. Lament psalms help us to be real without feeling guilt, without feeling denial. See, life sometimes is utterly unbearable. But our culture teaches us that that's a taboo not to be dealt with in public or private and the lament psalms help us to feel God has given us emotions and feelings these psalms show us that it's okay to feel angry vengeful disappointment and sad at God and others And these psalms help us to appeal in prayer, appeal to God, to reach out to God from a place of honesty and pain and not feel bad about it. And lastly, these psalms, they help us to heal. You see, our God hung on a cross, lamenting. He actually quoted a lament psalm, Psalm 22. But that lament psalm ends in hope and restoration and justice. These psalms bring alongside us God in our darkest moments. They pointing to hope and healing alongside a crucified Savior. So, good morning, welcome to church. <laughs> That's where we're going today. We're going to be looking at how these psalms help us to be real, to feel, to appeal, and to heal. See, here at Love Church, one of our, well, our primary overarching value is to be real, isn't it? We say that, to be real, and then it breaks down into the other bits, but to be real. And that means to be honest about life, honest about the gritty reality of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, for good and for bad. In this psalm we heard, it says this, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? The psalmist is saying, how long must I bear this pain? How long will my enemies gloat over me? If we're honest with ourselves, life is a little bit full of um, uh, shallow and fake conversations, isn't it? It's very British of us, if those of us who are British in the room. Hey, uh, Jody, how you doing? Yeah, fine, blessed. Hey, Fabio, uh, how's tricks? Great, great. I'm I'm worn out and and tired and I can't make my bills, but hey, yeah, God's good. Hey, Marcella, how's your business? Ah, not bad. Um, My partner embezzled all the money and uh, I'm losing my house, but God gives and God takes away, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're told to put on a brave face, to remember that the Lord is good. Don't let the pain out. Because that's a taboo. But when we're allowed to be real, we do not need to pretend. We do not need to work out a good theology. We don't need to go and ask St. Paul what he says about suffering. We don't need to worry about what, how a good Christian should respond to their pain. Honestly, forget all of that. Forget it. It's time to be real, to be raw, to unload to give it to God with both barrels, to stand naked, exposed. Here I am, God. Here I am. I'm angry and I'm confused. And it's okay to be confused in our pain, totally okay. I mean, talk about a mixed up theology. Check this out. This is from Lamentations 3, which is basically one massive psalm of disorientation. This, uh, this writer is speaking of God. He says, or she says, uh, I am one who has seen affliction under the, under the rod 
of God's wrath. He, God, has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. He, God, has made my flesh and my skin waste away and broken my bones. He, God, is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He, God, led me off my way and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. This goes on for 21 verses. And then, immediately, he says... But the steadfast love of God never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Utterly confused. And that's all right. That's all right. See, the Psalms of disorientation allow us to be real. Real about the situation we're in. Real about our confusion real about how we feel to God at that moment and others without feeling guilt and without bottling it all up. So the Psalms allow us to, um, to be real. They also encourage us to feel. The, um, the neuroscientist and author Jill Bolt Taylor, one of Time magazine's 100 most influential people, she said this. She said, most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel. But actually, we're feeling creatures that think. Think of it. Think of it. Everything we think, everything the way we act, it's all a result of our felt physical world being processed, filtered by our emotions. Have you ever been hangry? Yeah? Your blood sugar levels are low, you're tired, you're hungry, and a colleague, say Tim, comes and says something really stupid. <laughs> How do you respond? <laughs> How do you respond? If you weren't hungry, you'd definitely respond differently, wouldn't you? You see, we work from the gut. You know, that joy you had at your first dance if you're married, that grief you feel at a loved one's funeral, the laughter you have when you hear an infant laughing. See, none of that, none of that comes from our intellect, does it? We have emotions, we have feelings, we have love, we feel hungry, we feel tired, anger, lust, disappointment, shame, pride, grief, fear, happiness, joy, contentment, empowerment. God, given emotions all being processed in a broken world by a broken person, me (laughs) and you. But our emotions are okay. And extreme emotions and extreme circumstances are okay. Think of Jesus at Lazarus' tomb. Jesus wept. Think of Jesus at Gethsemane, sweating blood. Father, take this cup from me you see it's really important that we talk about mental health we need to talk more about it we need to lose the stigma of feeling rubbish you see somehow we still think that it's not okay to be feeling things that we need to keep that stiff upper lip to bury the pain how quickly do we medicate our feelings whether that's just scrolling through our phones. Maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's wine, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's sex, maybe it's diazepam. And it's okay to feel rubbish when rubbish things happen. It's not okay to feel rubbish when rubbish things aren't happening. That's when we seek medical attention. That's the place we go to. See, we have a God-given channel of communication. A place where we are encouraged, open, real dialogue. And all of this was way before Freud. See, we must talk and we must pray. The psalmist says, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart. Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. We can be real with our feelings, even the bad ones. 
I mean, that feeling of vengeance, that feeling of wanting to get your own back on someone. It's a nasty feeling, right? Psalm 109 is full of cries to God for violent vengeance against an abuser. May his days be few. May his children be fatherless. May his children be homeless. But we're not supposed to feel like that, are we? We're good Christians. We're not supposed to feel like that. One seminary teacher asked his class who Psalm 109 might be for today in this world, now. And one female, one young female put up a hand and she said, the woman who's just been raped. Get him, Lord. Get him. Because violent attack, sexual assault, being robbed, loved ones taken from us, money stolen from a business, whatever it is, we feel anger and we want justice. Worse, we may even want them dead. So what do you do with these feelings? You've got three options. I think we've got three options as to what you do, the ways that you respond. Number one, number one is you can act it out. I am not recommending that. <laughs> I am not recommending that this morning. That is not an option. It's not going to go well. Secondly, we can bottle it up. We can suppress it. We can push it down. But we all know what happens when we do that with with pain and stress. We become sick and we become unwell. Or thirdly, we can take it to God. My kids fight. Then you know my kids better than Ben. Believe it or not, they fight. In fact, they had a fight yesterday and they come screaming into Hooch and me and there's, honestly, it's absolute pandemonium. They're crying and they're shouting at each other and they're shouting at us. One of them's got a red kick mark on their, on their thigh and we sort it out. We, we, we calm down, we separate them and we say, guys, no, it's all right. We sort out the bruise. And then the one who's being kicked is like, but dad, punish her. Or him. <laughs> take it, take, take their phone away. Do something, Dad. Punish them. What do I do? Do I sort of go, like, okay, okay, all right, son, daughter, I'll take notes. Tell me what to do, tell me what to do. Or do I say, once I've got rid of my own anger, <laughs> leave it with me. Leave it with me. I've got this. I've heard you. I love you. Just chill out. (laughs) That's our Heavenly Father. That's what God says to us. So our Psalms of disorientation, they allow us to be real about the situation we're in and they allow us to feel the very raw motions. And then they allow us to appeal to God, to appeal to God. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Did you know it's okay to nag God? It is. Seriously. In Luke, Jesus says, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. She's lamenting. For uh, for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will seek that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. I love that line. And the Lord said, Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. See, when we complain, when we petition, we actually get to motivate God. Here's a truth. You can put this in the bank. Our prayers cause God to do things that God would not otherwise have done. 
Jesus says it. Jesus says it. Mind blown, it's true. And so when we are petitioning God, if we need to, if we need to, we can use exaggerated language. It's absolutely fine. God, I'm dying here. My bones are out of joint. My mouth is dry. My mouth is dried up. My hands and my feet are shriveled. And that's all really from Psalm 22. That's the psalm Jesus quotes when he's on the cross. Maybe for him at that point, not so exaggerated. See, these psalms give us a framework for our own prayers. Have you ever written a psalm? Have you? Anybody written their own psalm? It's a wonderful, wonderful exercise, a poem prayer. I really commend it to you. Try it. If you're taking notes, it's suggested that there are uh, six components usually in these disorientation psalms. The first is that they name God. God, you are God. Then they offer a complaint to God. I'm surrounded by idiots who keep dragging me down. Then they petition God. God, do something about it. Then fourthly, they motivate God. Do it or they'll gloat over my faith and I'll give up and I'll become an atheist. (laughs) Then they call from vengeance to God. God, get them. And may they have an itch they can never scratch. And then lastly, number six, they praise God. Lord, I trust you and I worship you. You alone are good. You see, when we are in these depths of disorientation, we have permission. In fact, we have encouragement to appeal to God, to nag God, to cry out to God. And if the truth be told... Not all these psalms end in praise. Sometimes we can't quite get there. And that's okay too. God's pride won't be dented. Praise isn't for him anyway. It's actually for us. There will be a time If you can't do it now, there will be a time when you can praise him again. So be real, feel it, appeal to God. And lastly, we can heal. Has anybody here seen, or most of you I'm sure have seen, the movie Forrest Gump? Forrest Gump, remember that? 90s movie? I love the movie Forrest Gump. We watched it only a couple of days ago. In that movie is a chap called Lieutenant Dan. Remember Lieutenant Dan? I love Lieutenant Dan. Lieutenant Dan is this, um, there he is. Lieutenant Dan is this, um, uh, he, he's from a long line of like war heroes, people that have, have died in battle. And um, he goes out to Vietnam. And Forrest, our, our, our sort of like main character, he, uh, oh, actually, in, whilst they're in Vietnam, uh, an incendiary device goes off and Lieutenant Dan loses his legs. And um, uh, Forrest sort of like picks him up and he picks up a whole lot of other people and he carries them out and he saves his life. But Lieutenant's life, Lieutenant Stan's life begins to spiral down. He becomes this drunk, angry, homeless war veteran. He's angry that he was saved, angry about being in a wheelchair, angry that he didn't die in battle. So uh, him, and, him and Forrest, they become, oh, that's a great picture. Him and Forrest become um, uh, friends again a little bit later on in life. And uh, they, funnily enough, they actually become shrimping boat millionaires. Remember that? The Bubba Gump Shrimping Corporation? And um, before they do, before they do, they're out on a shrimping boat. And this storm whips up. And um, it's howling around, absolutely howling around them. There's waves crashing over the boat. The wind's whipping through. And Lieutenant Dan is up there at the top of the mast. And Lieutenant Dan begins to lament. You call this a storm? It's time for a showdown, you and me, God. It's you and me, you son of a... And he does. 
He lets it all out. He shouts and laments at God. That pent up anger of losing his legs, dying, not dying in the, in the war zone, being in a wheelchair. But the next scene we see of Lieutenant Dan is an absolute changed man. He's got his composure, his colour back in his um, cheeks. He's happy. He's at peace with life. And he actually ends up jumping into the sea, swimming backwards, thanking Forrest for saving his life. And then Forrest says in his wonderful southern accent, he, actually, he never actually said so, but I think he made his peace with God. That was really bad. <laughs> I'm not going to do that tonight. Don't do that tonight. <laughs> you see, there is healing in our cries when we cry out to the healer. Jesus cried from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that one line of Psalm 22, Jesus implies the entire psalm, from complaint to petition to motivation to rescue and praise. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. On the cross, our God, our Saviour, meets us in our pain and our anguish. Our saviour is forsaken by the Father and he comes alongside us in the depths of our despair. And when we are ready, when we're ready, he'll lift our heads, lift our eyes and he'll give us a new horizon, a new vista. Because Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Now, as I said, these psalms don't always end in praise. Sometimes, sometimes we don't always get healed now here in this life. Human suffering can't be explained easily. It can't be escaped, but it can be endured. It can be endured when the one who endured the cross is invited in. And sometimes our scars will remain. Jesus himself carried scars into new creation. In his book, uh, God on Mute, if you've not read it uh, by Pete Gregg, if you've not read it, I commend it to you. It's a fantastic book. Pete tells the story of a young woman who loses um, unborn IVF twins at 22 weeks. Um, I'm going to read a prayer, she wrote, okay, and it's real, and it's really painful, and I stand here knowing that so many of us, this is a real situation, it is for me and it is for Hooch, we have had two miscarriages before, so I just wanted to give a little bit of a trigger warning, for any of us who have lost, who feel pain, who are, who struggle at times, But I hope with all we've spoken about this morning that we can endure this together. She said, Dear God, I really don't know how to talk to you anymore, but I've been told that I should try. See, ever since you, ever since you took the boys from me, I've been on emotional lockdown. Why would I let you back into my heart when you treated me so badly? How could you abandon me that way? This letter to you is only an exercise, an attempt to make contact. But be careful if you show up. I can scream and scream loud. 
and I have some things I want to say to you. So even with my, um, if you were standing here before me, I'd hit you. I want to tell you to go away, to leave me alone. In truth, I want to beg you to stay. Because even with my beloved standing here with me, my amazing friends, my internet support team, I have never felt so expletive alone. So stay here, you expletive. Stay here and make this better because it hurts so expletive much. It's real. It's raw. I read in an article just yesterday, um, uh, Bono from U2, he said, uh, behind lament lurks hope. Yeah, grief becomes a kind of invocation, doesn't it? A prayer to be filled, he laughs, talking about his music. Yeah, punk rock prayers. That's probably what his music was. (laughs) Punk rock prayers. I think we've all got some punk rock prayers. In Jeremiah, I'm I'm coming to Ashley, where's Alex? Why don't you guys come up? Um, In Jeremiah, there's a story um, of a potter potter's house the potter is at his wheel and he's forming a clay pot but Jeremiah sees that this pot breaks under his hands in his hands and so he remolds it into a different vessel and God says can I not do this with my people can I not do this with my people So many of us really are carrying around grief and we're crushed and we're lost. Some of us feel like that clay under that potter's hands, crushed by life. What if we bring that this morning to him? What if we, what if we allow ourselves to bring that to him this morning? To bring it to God? To deal with that pain? we will have an opportunity. I I don't quite know how we'll we'll do this. Because I I know that there is is pain for so many of us. But something new can form from that pain. Something new can come from it. Something that can contain life again. If If you're able, why don't you...